So there are three criteria that need to be met in order to qualify as a doctor of the church. So the first thing is eminent learning. And so what they mean by that is that you exhibit sort of a high degree of intelligence and learning and also familiarity with the theological tradition, and also that you are contributing to the theological tradition. In some ways, building on what is best within the theological tradition, so making significant contributions. So that's the first thing, eminent learning. The second thing is high degree of sanctity. So in terms of how these people are living their lives, that they are considered to be holy men and women in terms of how they handle themselves day in and day out. And then the third thing is that the, there needs to be an official recognition that is made by the Catholic Church that they meet those first two criteria. So someone can't just appoint themselves as a doctor of the church as they think that they meet those first two criteria. Now, the interesting thing is that this designation, doctor of the church, is in some ways a kind of late development if we look at the long history of the Catholic Church. So interestingly, in terms of when people were writing their theological writings, of course, they would cite theologians that came before them. And there were four male theologians who sort of quickly emerged as sort of the most frequently cited theologians. And those were Ambrose of Milan, Augustine of Hippo, then Jerome, who moved from Rome to Jerusalem or the environs of Jerusalem, and then also Gregory the Great. And so those four male writers became the most frequently cited, and they became even more cited through the 12th and 13th centuries. And what's important about those periods of time is that that's when universities started to emerge. And so when universities started to emerge, we see theological faculties. And so people that are studying within those disciplines, and also we see teachers that are dedicated to those disciplines. And those teachers start to write their own treatises, and they're frequently citing those four theologians. And so what ends up happening at the end of the 13th century, in 1298, Pope Boniface VIII actually made this official designation of doctor of the church and named Ambrose, Augustine, Jerome, and Gregory as doctors of the church. And he said that they met those two criteria of eminent learning and also high degree of sanctity, and then gave them that official designation. And then from there, what ends up happening is we sort of have a gap of several hundred years until we see our next doctor of the church, and that's in 1567 when Pope Pius V named Thomas Aquinas as the fifth doctor of the church. And then a year later, and I think this is a very ecumenical move, so it's a, a move that tries to include other Christians that are not a part of the Roman Catholic Church. So in this case, it's actually to include Christians that at this time were a part of the Orthodox Church and Eastern Christianity. So there were four really famous theologians there who were venerated as doctors of the church within the Eastern Church, and they were also named doctors of the church then. So the four Eastern Fathers of the Church were Athanasius, Basil the Great, John Chrysostom, and Gregory Nazianzus. And so then that sort of rounds us out Then we had nine Doctors of the Church at that point. It took 700 years after those first four male Doctors of the Church were designated as such as Doctors of the Church for the first two women to be named Doctors of the Church. So in 1970, Catherine of Siena and Teresa of Avila were named the first two women doctors of the church. So Catherine of Siena lived in Siena, Italy. In the second half of the 13th century, she only lived to the age of 33, interestingly. And Catherine of Siena is significant not only for her theological writings, so famously she wrote this work called The Dialogue, and it's this dialogue between her and Christ, so she has a number of visions in which she's actually speaking to Jesus, and Jesus is also speaking to her, and she recorded those visions that she received, and those visions were compiled together in this work that is known as The Dialogue. Also, famously for Catherine, a number of letters also survive, and what's interesting about those letters is that it shows Catherine 
Catherine's extensive network in terms of people that she was associated with. And these include people not only within Siena or even within Italy, but even people you know, more broadly within Europe. And these people also included the popes at the time. And famously, Catherine traveled to both Avignon, which is in southern France, and also to Rome to visit the popes at the time, because at this time, actually there was a division within the papacy, and the papacy at the time had actually moved away from Rome to Avignon, France. And Catherine recognized how this was tearing the church apart, and so she went to the pope at the time to encourage him to move back to Rome to try to heal these divisions that were within the church. So that was Catherine within the 13th century. And then we jump forward to the 16th century in Spain, which is where Teresa of Avila was located, so Avila, Spain. And Teresa is famous, actually, for, for reforming the Carmelite order at the time. And she's actually the founder of the Discalced Carmelites. And what we mean by Discalced is actually shoeless, the shoeless Carmelites. And the reason why they didn't wear shoes or they usually just wear sandals is a sign of their poverty and also of their humility. At the time, Teresa recognized that there were certain excesses that had cropped up within the Carmelite order, and she felt that certain reforms needed to happen. And so she took that upon herself to reform the Carmelite order. And as a part of this reform effort, she actually ended up founding or establishing a number of houses that were associated with the discalced Carmelites throughout Spain. And so this actually required her to travel almost the length and breadth of Spain. And she did it usually under a covered wagon, traveling often at the dead of night in all kinds of weather in order to found these different houses. And in the midst of doing all of this traveling, she also wrote a number of different works, including an autobiography of herself and also a number of different sort of theological treatises that were also based on the visions that she was receiving. So one is called The Interior Castle and another is called The Way of Perfection. And then also she wrote a kind of history of the different foundations that she made as well, which is a really fascinating read. And then it took another 27 years for the next woman to be named a doctor of the church, and that was Therese of Lisieux. And Therese actually lived at the end of the 19th century in Normandy, France, so northern France. And Therese was also a Carmelite, and so in some ways is a distant sister then of, of Teresa of Avila. And Therese actually ended up entering the Carmelite order when she was the age of 15 and ended up following three of her sisters into the house. And Therese is extraordinary in some ways because she was always a sickly child and ended up developing tuberculosis, so this terrible respiratory disease that ended up killing her at the age of 23. But before she ended up dying, she wrote a number of works, including an autobiography of herself, which is called The Story of a Soul, and also a number of plays. My favorite is she wrote a play of Joan of Arc, and there are these incredible pictures of Therese dressed up as Joan of Arc. So she actually has armor on, and the really beautiful pictures of her. And then poems and prayers. And the wonderful thing is that at the time, her sister, Pauline, was actually the prioress of her community. So that meant she was the head of the Carmel there in Lisieux. And Pauline, and her name was Mother Agnes at the time, she had encouraged her sister, Therese, to write all of these different things and also made sure that those writings were preserved. And Pauline was instrumental in actually making the case for Therese's canonization. Then, after Therese of Lisieux in 1997, it took until 2012 for the fourth woman doctor of the church to be named as such, and that was Hildegard of Bingen. So this extraordinary 12th century Benedictine abbess who lived during the 12th century, so was born about 1098 and lived until the ripe old age about 79, which was incredible at the time to live until that long. And over the course of that time, 
Actually, Hildegard wrote a number of different types of writing from what we consider to be mystical, theological writings, so writings that were informed by the visions that she received. She actually started to receive these visions at the age of eight and continued to receive these visions throughout her life, but actually never told anyone that she had been receiving these visions until she was the age of 40. And it was because at that time, God had told her that it was time for her to start writing down her writings. And so she did. And those writings actually received papal approval, which was very unusual at the time. She wrote to the Pope of the day, Eugenius III, to ask for his approval, and he granted it. And from there, she wrote two more mystical theological writings, and then also wrote a number of scientific treatises, medical treatises, and also was this extraordinary composer of music, and also composed a play that was set to music. And, and she did this throughout her life. And so it took until 2012 for Hildegard to be named a doctor of the church and also a saint as well. <laughs>